Hello, I'm Maureen Reedy, the President and CEO of the Paley Center for Media. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to a very important and timely Paley Impact Program titled Media's Role in Identifying, Explaining, and Combating Antisemitism. This event is the first in our new quarterly series and our ongoing effort to examine media's powerful shaping influence and unique ability to raise awareness around the growing crisis of antisemitism. This conversation and subsequent events in the series will seek to shine a light on how media in all its forms can educate, inform, and make an impact on this vitally important issue. All programs in this series are made possible by Sherry Redstone and Arie and Alana Burkhoff, whom we thank for their most generous support. In America and around the world, we are witnessing an alarming rise in anti-Semitism. To discuss this crisis and how media can help us understand anti-Semitism, recognize it in our society, and take steps to do something about it, we are honored to bring together several leading voices on the subject. Our panelists include influential figures from prominent Jewish organizations and cultural institutions, as well as from the fields of entertainment, journalism, and education. Never before has Paley's mission been more vital as media has been the undisputed connector to a nation in these unprecedented times. And Paley is uniquely positioned to meet this moment with impactful conversations led by influential figures such as those that we are truly honored to have with us today. We welcome to our conversation, Amy Bressman, president of the UJA Federation of New York, Rabbi Abraham Cooper, Associate Dean and Director of Global Social Action for the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Holly Huffnagel, U.S. Director for Combating Antisemitism for the American Jewish Committee. Brad Meltzer, author and historian. And Mark Wilf, Chair of the Board of Trustees for the Jewish Federations of North America. Now, before we start the program, there's one brief housekeeping note. If you are tweeting, our hashtag on Twitter is hashtag Paley Impact. And now I'm so pleased to welcome our moderator, Rebecca Jarvis, ABC News Chief Business Technology and Economics Correspondent. She reports all of ABC News programs and platforms and is also the host of the podcast, No Limits with Rebecca Jarvis, which features in-depth interviews with female CEOs, founders, and innovators. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca Jarvis. Thank you, Maureen. It is my pleasure to be with everyone today. Welcome to Paley Impact, media's role in identifying, explaining, and combating anti-Semitism, part of the Paley at Home series. I'm Rebecca Jarvis, ABC's Chief Business Technology and Economics Correspondent, and it is my pleasure to introduce our panel to you today. I'm pleased to welcome Amy Bressman, President of UJA Federation of New York, Rabbi Abraham Cooper, Associate Dean and Director of Global Social Action at the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Holly Huffnagel, U.S. Director for Combating Antisemitism of the American Jewish Committee. Brad Meltzer, an author and historian. And Mark Wilf, Chair of the Board of Trustees at Jewish Federations of North America. It's a pleasure to be with everyone here today. And I'm thrilled to be a part of this panel on such an important topic. I want to start with going around so that everyone gets an opportunity to weigh in on this. What is the one thing that the media can do to identify, explain, and combat anti-Semitism? One specific thing that the media can be doing differently to target that end. Holly, why don't we start with you? One thing, how about promote national cohesion? around the issue of anti-Semitism, that it's, it's all of our issue and we need to rebuild civil society to combat it together. Maybe actually get off the media so we can actually meet our neighbor and join that community and respond together. Amy. I would say it's not surrender the power of the media, but understand its power and understand that what the responsibility is, is to always present issues in a nuanced way do not rely on old caricatures, do not rely on old stereotypes, but use the power in a 24 seven news cycle to actually give the story in a nuanced and more layered way. Mark. I would just, if you want a simple one thing, it's complicated, but a simple thing, make sure to have as many positive stories as negative stories. 
to not be fearful, be courageous, even though it may not push the ratings for every negative story about a community, doesn't have to be Jewish, any negative story, try to portray it as accurately as you can and be positive and fair with an alternate positive story as well. Rabbi Cooper. Well, put a human face. Let's go away from the statistics. I hate to quote Joseph Stalin, but he said, or supposedly said, one death uh, is a tragedy, a million deaths a statistic. Let's get away from the statistics, which is the only time the media seems to be revisiting a poll, uh, how many crimes, yeah, all of that is important and critical. That should be one sentence. The most important thing is let's put a human face on the challenges before us. And that's not just a challenge to the media, as uh, my now uh, aging friend, Holly, who I know from the time she first came to LA. Um, we need allies, but the responsibility also comes to the Jewish community. Uh, the opportunity, first of all, to know who you are, education. And secondly, uh, to have the courage and the, frankly, the decency to reach out to your neighbor and normalize and humanize those contacts. Only good will come from that. Brad? Um, I agree I, I, with everyone. And I, we need all these things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from my favorite author, myself. And this is what I put, this is, this is what I wrote for the the little kids to learn Anne Frank. And it says, in the Jewish faith, there's a saying, if a person saves one life, it's as if they've saved an entire world. Throughout your life, you'll find people who need help. Be a helper. Be the one who does the right thing. When you see something that's unfair, do not be silent. Sometimes it will be hard when it is look up. See the beauty of the world, as Anne Frank says, and see the beauty in people. I think if we give our kids education, and, and our adults, education about what really happened, but again, as the rabbi said, um, the humanity of who we are, uh, you'll see people understand how much we have in common. And that's where hope is. That's what hope is, right? It's a fire that burns within us and we decide when we put it on. And when you do, nothing puts it out. Beautiful. Brad, thank you so much for sharing that. I want to bring into the conversation the question of how the anti-Semitism has impacted each of our panelists in their everyday lives and where they've seen it. And Amy, I'm hoping we can begin with you. I have an interesting story of anti-Semitism in the sense that I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and that is the Bible Belt of America. And one of the opportunities that I had was to be an ambassador in my senior year in high school for the National Conference of Christians and Jews. And in Kansas, I can truly say that the majority of the population has never met anyone Jewish. And an outstanding memory I have from that time was I went to a very small house in Kansas. And I wondered actually, as I drove up to the house, if that was where they filmed in cold blood. And I'm sitting inside of the bedroom as the family is gathered outside my bedroom door that I'm staying in their home. And they say, I really thought that she would have horns. I'm so surprised that she doesn't have that. And they certainly were a lovely family to invite a Jewish person into their home. But it was a reminder that sometimes we have perceptions that are just inaccurate. And I was the first Jew in that town. I'm probably the only Jew that ever visited that town. And I think for me, it has been something I've kept in my heart always that good people can make mistakes by just really not knowing what they're saying and how what they say can impact others. Which is such a valuable point as we delve deeper today into the media's role um, in helping to combat anti-Semitism and education around anti-Semitism. So thank you for sharing that experience, Amy. One of the aspects that the Paley Center takes very seriously is the idea of the media in a very large sense, TV, uh, the written media, but then also social media. And, you know, Tahali, you touched on something that makes it much more complex today, perhaps, than it was previously, which is conspiracy theories. They can find their way around the world so quickly in the realm of social media. Um, you hear about it on WhatsApp. And so the world that we live in today 
seems to have really shifted in many ways that make this more complex. Um, Mark, I wanna bring you into the conversation here as chair of the board of trustees at the Jewish Federations of North America. What do you think the media in the big sense can be doing to combat this issue and also raise awareness about anti-Semitism? Well, thanks, Rebecca, and thanks to the Paley Center for really uh, spotlighting uh, the critical issues we're talking about today. Uh, I think a, 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 a real important word here is education. And uh, that's how uh, ignorance, apathy, these things are the things that lead to the kind of problems we're seeing. So uh, I think the media, uh, popular culture too often promotes negative ideas, maybe about religious people, uh, e e even TV shows. Um, you know, for example, uh, a recent episode NBC had of nurses told the story of an Orthodox Jewish character, but the characters, there were a lot of inaccuracies, and that's just one example, but these, these inaccuracies, these stereotypes are the kind of things that can lead to potential harm. So um, we at the Jewish Federations, 146 communities around the entire United States and Canada, uh, work very hard on educating uh, on college campuses, uh, interfaith, to really have a dialogue, to better explain the nuances. And also, I think the media has a role to not just have negative stories, but, but positive stories. Um, you know, for instance, the Jewish community is very diverse. People don't realize uh, nearly 20% of the Jewish community is racially and ethnically diverse. So these are the kind of uh, nuances and detail that I think the media can have a real role to, to give context, to give co uh, a texture to the richness of the Jewish community. And that we aren't the other, but that we together, we have to make sure there's no discrimination and there's better tolerance among each other. So that's, that's the role I think media can help and be more positive in terms of the story that they're telling. I want to bring into the conversation Rabbi Cooper, the Simon Weisenthal Center Associate Dean and Director of Global Social Action. Um, and Rabbi Cooper, talk a little bit about your personal experiences with anti-Semitism. Well, I've been very lucky in my life to have been uh, impacted and guided by many mentors, especially Simon Wiesenthal, the great Nazi hunter himself, who was first a victim of the Nazis. He and his wife lost 89 members of their family. He barely was, uh, he crawled out in Mauthausen to fall into the arms of an American soldier in May 1945, and then became uh, a champion for justice. And he would always say, it always starts with the Jews. It never ends with the Jews. And I found also in him a great teacher because while he was a heroic campa a campaigner against anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, and hate, um, he had no hate in his heart. Uh, he felt it was important to invest in future generations. Uh, I've been with the Wiesenthal Center, it's my 44th year. So I get, and I'm the person who gets the intakes day in and day out, 24, six, Sabbaths excluded, uh, of the bad news, uh, of the darkness, uh, et cetera. And um, it's easy to be overwhelmed if that's all you focus on. Uh, we Jews are the targets of anti-Semitism. There's no way that we alone could defeat it. We need allies, we need friends. And what I've learned also in my travels, especially a place like Asia, uh, but uh, Amy's first story is perfect. The majority of the world has never met a Jew. If you go on social media, you hear terrible things about him day in and day out. If you look at the headlines, et cetera. But um, I found that, and we'll get to it, I'm sure, later, that the most important uh, element for Jewish people to combat anti-Semitism is A, to have friends and allies, non-Jews, who can help lead the fight, um, and in addition to that, we should never allow bigots to dictate the narrative. And that means we have an, uh, the responsibility to also share with our own community and beyond, okay, so you don't go to synagogue on the Sabbath to plot the economic downfall of Japan, as one uh, leader once said to me. But he asked a great question. So what do Jews do in synagogue? So in approaching my life personally and approaching this challenge as it gets harder and harder, I make sure every day not to go to the stereotypes and not to be part of the problem, but to fight it as someone with good self-awareness 
and, uh, and blessing every day that I'm an American who has the opportunity to reach out to a neighbor. Brad, I wonder, as both an author and a historian, if you can look at this, this question as both something personal, but also how it has changed and evolved over time. Yeah, I mean, the question of, of anti-Semitism? Yes. You know, uh, there's a great quote that always gets attributed to Mark Twain, but he never really said it, but he said, supposedly said that history uh, doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. And that's how we see it, right? You, you, you can look right now, and I happen to be working uh, on a book right now about World War II, and all you see are the rhymes. You see them right where we are today. Look, you know, as we're recording this right now, we're looking at Israel potentially being in another new war. And um, these things rhyme, and they rhyme again. And I think the, the sad part is, um, is and I think the rabbi said it perfectly, as time which is all that it always starts with the Jews, it never ends with the Jews. But I think for me, when I look at it as a historian, when I look at it as an author, um, you have to change the narrative. We must control that and, and not control in that way of like, oh, the Jews control this, but we have to tell our stories. There's nothing more powerful than telling the stories and letting people know these stories. And to me, that's the best way to fight back. Um, and I think there are lots of ways to fight back, of course, but I think when we can tell our stories and share our stories, and, and, and you've heard it in all the answers you heard today, right? It's just when you meet more people and you educate them on what happens, and more important, when you speak up for others, um, I think that's the only way to, to really take that narrative and, and regain control of it. Otherwise, people are gonna be writing our stories for us, and, and so far, nothing comes from that. You look at the Anti-Defamation League, they said in 2019, I think it was 2,100 anti-Semitic incidents. They said it was the largest increase they had, most incidents in the 40 years they've been tracking them. That's now, that's today, in 40 years. And to me, the other part as a historian I say is you gotta ask yourself why. Why is that happening now? And you know, we, I think it's no surprise when you see the rhetoric by leaders turned up so high. Um, when we create a culture where you have an us and a them, get ready. That's what's going to happen. And we have to get rid of us and them and remind ourselves that we always do best when there's a we. Holly, I wonder from your vantage point as the U.S. Director for Combating Anti-Semitism for the American Jewish Committee, what do you see as the most important thing the media can be doing right now to inform people about anti-Semitism? Rebecca, thank you for, for asking that question and to the Paley Center for hosting this, this panel. I think we have to understand two things. One is what we're looking for, especially online and on social media where anti-Semitism has, has really morphed into new forms, um, but often still uses the same historic models, which I think Brad might've been referencing that you know, we just, many people don't even know what those look like. And the second thing is, is why, it, why does it matter? Why does it matter for the majority of the world who's not Jewish to be part of recognizing it, to be part of identifying it, to be part of fighting it? And, you know, I think the first part about the um, raising awareness, the recognizing it, is that we need to understand the complexity of anti-Semitism today, that it's not just a, a hatred of Jews, which I think many people think, oh, it might be just a hatred of Jews. It's actually much more. It's a certain perception. It's conspiracy. It's about um, Jewish power, control, or wealth, where Jews are assailed for their perceived superiority not just the inferiority that we see with other forms of racism and, and bigotry. And, and that's really important as is, where does it come from? Is it the far right, the far left, from religious extremists, even from within segments of minority communities, which it's, it's hard. It's hard to speak out unambiguously when it doesn't come from a easy to identify source. And so that's a, something that the media, I think can actually play a role in, in sharing the truth and sharing those, those stories today. Uh, on that idea, um, Amy, coming back around to you as president of UJ Federation of New York, and especially in this idea of reaching younger audiences who are largely spending their lives online and are largely getting a lot of information from social media, how can the media do a better job of reaching those audiences? I'm just going to respond by saying one thing that I think has been extremely interesting over this last year is the heightened sensitivity to racial and ethnic diversity. 
And one of the things that I think has been a lesson that this time has taught is how much words matter and how much these microaggressions matter. And I think building on the comment that Mark just made, I think it is incumbent upon the media and in the case of social media to be sensitive to the words that are chosen to describe an incident or a case. And I agree with you fully that social media reaches so many people and phrasing something in one way versus another can greatly impact its meaning. And I think having people take the time to look at what their words are saying, how they will be interpreted, and what message they are delivering is something that is incumbent upon us. I don't think that every single person who puts up something that is an anti-Semitic trope understands what they're saying. So I think taking the time to not only educate others, but to educate yourself before you choose the words that you do, when you tell a story, when you describe a situation, that is what is incumbent upon us. And I think as we talk about the role that UJA Federation plays, we're really careful how we use our social media. We deliver messages in a way that they can be received. And the words that we choose are carefully thought about. And I do think that that is a lesson that can impact media and how a particular story is displayed, how a television show approaches a character, how someone on Saturday Night Live gives a commentary. Each of these areas, I think just taking the secondary two-step verification on the words that you use is critical to making a change. Um, just listening to Amy talk, um, Rabbi Cooper, it, it made me think about the relationship between organizations like yours, like hers, like the organizations that many of you represent today and the media. And, and this idea that a lot of the consumption of media uh, on social, it's younger, but there's also a new class of journalists who is walking into newsrooms, might not have uh, the history, the background. What kinds of things do you think both newsrooms as well as organizations like yours can be doing together to really broaden the understanding of anti-Semitism today? Right. So, you know, where's William Paley when we need him? Uh, with all due respect, young people walking in uh, with a name tag does not make him a journalist. And as far as the media is concerned, they seem to be spending a lot more effort uh, trying to catch up to the wokeness on social media, which, of course, has no filter, no fact checkers and elevating, uh, you know, people because they're quote unquote influencers instead of going back to their core responsibility. Look, part of, the, part of the responsibility right now of what's going on with unprecedented hate crimes against the Jewish people here in the United States, part of that rests on our shoulders for the following reason. Anti-Semitism today is a political football. Uh, it is for Jewish organizations. Uh, it is filtered by the media so that they would be politically correct. Uh, and that is a huge problem in basically saying uh, one station, well, the problem is all uh, far right. And the others will say it's all progressives. And a third will say, well, there are certain words we're not going to use. And there are certain contemporary sacred cows we're not going to take and hold accountable. And that includes the Linda Sarsors and some of the folks in Black Lives Matter. Uh, now, look, as far as the Wiesenthal Center is concerned, our Museum of Tolerance, which unfortunately is still closed right now, we, we've had over 7 million people come through. We trained police. Uh, we know all about racism and hate, but we're also taught in our traditions not to allow race you know, to dictate our uh, actions. So the job of journalists isn't to choose up sides or to make one particular group or organization shine for a three minute piece. It's to try to you know, help us dig for truth. I grew up in the streets of New York in the, in the 60s, uh, even late 50s and early 60s, et cetera. And, and I broke the channel changer uh, uh, 50 times when I was a little kid. But you know, when Cronkite came on or the 20th century, that's where we learned how to care about the world. Well, kids are now learning what and from whom. So you know, with all due respect to the current list of 120 channels, but looking back to our core, of CBS, NBC, and ABC. You guys are not doing the job. You're too busy 
running after this uh, wokeness instead of helping us to push a uh, council culture, not a cancel culture. Yeah, but I think, you know, we always love to blame the media, but if the appetite wasn't there, you can't serve it if people aren't eating it. Well, and, and you're touching on this idea of how fractured the media is today and also how quickly uh, the work is being done, that it's being produced by large swaths of individuals. It's being pushed out through various social channels. The structure of large media companies, the names of companies that you just listed is a very, very different structure today than it was even 10, 20 years ago. I started in this business about 15 years ago and it is already just in my lifetime, a completely different uh, business. The way that the whole thing is managed, it's not top down to be, uh, you know, in the way that it used to be. Brad, given how fractured this environment is, um, there isn't this singular authority that reaches anyone any longer. Given that environment, how can the media help people identify anti-Semitism? Yeah, listen, um, I hate to say it, but I don't believe in the media anymore. Um, as a solution. I, I wish we could. I wish I could change it. We all of us would say, oh, we'll do this, do this, do this. But, but my real belief is we have to take matters in our own hands. It's why, I mean, I write kids' books. I, I, usually I write thrillers and mysteries about adult history, but I started writing kids' books because I was tired of kids looking at reality TV show stars and people who are famous being famous and thinking that's a hero. And I said, I, I can't trust the media to give them who I want to give them. I can't even trust my kid's school to do that anymore. So I started writing about Amelia Earhart and Dr. King and Rosa Parks. We did I Am Anne Frank. I mean, when my editors, I said to my editor, I want to do a kid's book about the Holocaust. My editor should have kicked me out right there. But you know what? She said, I think we need it right now more than ever. And she has that same belief I do, which is if you want the story out there, tell the story. Tell what you want to tell. And the interesting part to me of how you affect that, I mean, we do a TV show on PBS Kids called Xavier Riddle, where we put, you know, real stories of real heroes in cartoon form. Thanks to the pandemic, we had 7 million viewers that we were watching and, and, and watching online. With the pandemic, we went to 28 million kids. You know who I put there this year? Gold of my year. 28 million kids this year learned by, about gold of my year from me. And you know what, Brad, the little character who, most handsome cartoon character on the show does, he's playing with his dreidel one day. No big deal about it, no big explanation, but just normalizing it and making it there. And, and for me, the story goes like this. You know, my favorite story in I Am Am Frank, and this is, this, you know, this is how I think you affect that change, is when Am Frank's in the attic for those two years, her only view is, is this one window in the attic. If she gets too close to it, she can't, people will see her. So she has to kind of stay back. And when she stays back, her only view is this chestnut tree. And she just can see that chestnut tree. And in the winter, she sees the leaves fall off the chestnut tree. In the spring, they come back. Of course, Anne Frank dies in the Holocaust and they turn the attic and the house into a museum. They try to preserve the chestnut tree. But years ago, it actually fell down. But here's what happened. They took all the saplings that they can find from the tree and they started planting them all over the world. And now there are Anne Frank trees, chestnut trees blooming all over the world, stronger than ever. And to me, when we tell these stories to kids, the unbiased view, the, you know, the, the kids, who are, kids who don't know better right now, you tell that story to kids, that story is like that sapling in the chestnut tree. Anne Frank becomes a part of their lives. They become a part of hers. And that's how you change the world. I, you know, and to me, I'm using media, our own media, to do that, not you know, relying on me banging on the doors of, of different networks, but putting that story out there and creating our own media to make sure we have a, an effect real change out there. Brad, I have to say, um, Xavier has been in the background in my house, the PBS Kids app, especially during the pandemic. I have a two-year-old. Um, and it's so funny, uh, the episode involving the dreidel, I think my, my daughter was listening to it just the other day. It was in the background. I was getting ready for work and I heard it and I, it did, it gave me a pause for a second. Like, wow, this is just a typical kids cartoon, which by the way, I, I like because I think it overall teaches good values and things like that. But in, it was, I gave a pause for a second thinking, huh, 
There was no preamble. This wasn't in the special section for uh, Jewish kids or something like that. It was just a part of the overall storytelling. And Gold of My Year is right after the episode with Abraham Lincoln is right after. I mean, and, and when you can do that, there's, there's power in stories. If the, you know, as Jewish people, we know that more than anything, right? That's what the Torah is. It's not just a list of rules, which are plenty of rules. We all know them. But the Bible is filled with stories, these stories that tell us how to be and how to live and what we should do. So I, I just always go back to, and whether it's in media, whether it's in news, whether it's anyway, re rely on those stories. Holly, what's your take here? How can, if it's not the media, maybe there are things the media can be doing differently in your view, or how can this, this story of anti-Semitism, combating anti-Semitism, become a broader story that more people understand and appreciate in this moment? I am glad you asked that question, Rebecca. And Brad, that was a perfect segue because I was just going to say people today are bombarded with information. They're bombarded with, you know, quote unquote facts from all these different sources that, of course, contradict each other. And they're going to listen to how they feel about something, like how, how they connect the stories or people they trust. And it's like, how do we, we build, build trust? And a lot of that has to do with building coalitions with people who are, are different than us. So, you know, we've done a lot of studies on on Americans, on the population, and what they know about anti-Semitism, we actually found, AJC found that 46% of the US general public actually is not familiar with the word anti-Semitism. And, and even those that are, might not listen to someone who's Jewish or a Jewish organization to explain it. So you, we have to have those, those allies. And Rabbi Cooper said that at, that at the beginning, and, and many people in my work assume that I'm Jewish because it's in my title to combat anti-Semitism. So they're, they're like, therefore, oh, she must be Jewish because she's working to combat anti-Jewish prejudice. Uh, and I like to tell them, no, I'm not Jewish because this is actually not a Jewish problem. It's, you know, Rabbi Sachs, the late Rabbi Sachs said it, Jonathan Sachs said it best, you know, the, the hated can't cure the hate, the victim can't cure the crime. The, the onus is on the non-Jews actually to be part of this. And that's the, the, the societal issue. That's the, the non-Jews coming together to, to learn about what anti-Semitism is, why it affects our democracy and actually use the media. I, I think some of the best success stories we've actually seen is um, the story, like what Brad was just saying, but also with, with Holocaust education, um, Holocaust commemoration, fighting anti-Semitism, we've actually seen the media being used for good in new ways and pushing back. And we're not there yet. There's a lot of bad speech out there. But I think in the next five, 10 years, especially as social media companies begin to respond to the vitriol that's on their platforms, and there's so much work to be done there. But I think we're going to hopefully see some, some success in pushing back. Holly, I'm curious, what drew you as a non-Jew to the work of combating anti-Semitism? So I did not, I was one of those Americans who did not know what anti-Semitism was, did not really know about the Holocaust. What I did know about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, I thought really ended in 1945 and with the history book when that chapter closed. And it wasn't until I was in college and I studied at a Christian uh, university in Southern California and we traveled to Poland. And it was really when I was like 21 years old where I'm really learning about the history of Christian anti-Judaism. I, I grew up as a practicing Christian. We weren't, we didn't talk in my church. We didn't talk about, you know, the 2000 years of, of Christian anti-Judaism, which really set the stage for the Holocaust. And it was just so new information to me. Uh, and it was really when I was in, through education, just like um, what, what Brad and what um, Mark said that I kind of flipped and said, I need to be part of the solution. You know, I you know, can't repent for what's happened in the past, but I can be part of uh, the solution going forward. So that was what did it for me. Well, thank you for the work that you do. Um, Mark, you know, the situation, it's impossible to ignore the situation that is unfolding right now as we speak in Gaza and Israel. And uh, from your standpoint, how do you think the media can present the most uh, objective coverage of this story? Well, I think, I think it has to have a, a, be a fair portrayal and too, too often in the media, uh, that's not the case. Um, Israel is a sovereign nation and, uh, you know, has the ability and need to defend itself. Um, I, I think, again, a lot of it is education and understanding things and, and getting to what Brad said. I think a lot of it is incumbent, not just on the media, but on all of us uh, to make a better understanding that uh, it, Israel, again, has to defend itself. And uh, this is in a way uh, we're, we're all for dialogue and understanding. But on the other hand, there has to be a fairness to it. And I think too often uh, the media coverage and coverage in general uh, 
bends and tilts towards anti-Semitic anti uh, viewpoints. And, you know, just to give an example on how we all have to really um, pull our own boot bootstraps, each and every one of us on all this, uh, I'm a child of Holocaust survivors. And uh, I know 80 years ago when they were children, my parents, grandparents, all Holocaust survivors, there was no one looking out for them. Uh, my grandfather had to hide under the floorboards of a, of a barn for two years uh, to survive. And I lost an aunt who was who perished and, and, and many other personal uh, uh, effects of the Holocaust. And the fact of the matter is one in 10 uh, people in the United States believe the Jews caused the Holocaust. That's a recent study that was just taken up. So we as a society, generally, all of us have to be extremely concerned when young people can't name that any a single concentration camp. Uh, those are the kind of things the Holocaust is really the ultimate form of anti-Semitism. And uh, education, as I said before, um, uh, tolerance, understanding are all important. So getting back to what you said about Israel, um, you know, we have to be balanced in coverage and understanding of where Israel is coming from. And I think uh, that's been clear is that as a sovereign nation, it has its right to defend itself. In the context of this whole conversation, um, Rabbi Cooper, I, I want to come back to you on this topic because you and Brad have both talked about on some level writing off the media, that, that the media in, in the most general sense can't really be trusted to tell this story of anti-Semitism. And a part of me just has to wonder if that's the case, then where do we go? Yes, Brad talked about the work that he's done, the fact that he's taken matters into his own hands, but is that going to be enough in the long run? I mean, teaching right. people about the Holocaust, helping, as Mark just said, to inform people uh, about the concentration camps, especially as uh, Holocaust survivors are very few at this point. And, and the last generations of Holocaust survivors are, are very few in number at this point. Right. So as we speak, uh, I have one eye on another item here, seeing uh, the continuing uh, rockets and missiles falling all over uh, southern Israel. Uh, and uh, let me give uh, equal time uh, to uh, the social media giants uh, who have totally lost their way. Uh, they've become censors. Uh, they're uh, totally politicized. Uh, and um, we have a situation in which Hamas, as we speak, can use Twitter and social media platforms to inspire young Muslims in the Holy Land to go out and riot and attack their neighbors. While at the same time, we all know where they draw the line politically in such an overt way uh, here in the United States. Why is it that we allow the ultimate Holocaust denier, Ayatollah Khomeini, to continue to operate off of these social media uh, arenas. So I think, you know, uh, in general, uh, the elites in our country underestimate, quote unquote, the average person. Americans are furious right now uh, that they're being so overtly manipulated. But I have good news. You know, India, Japan, Hong Kong, once upon a time, um, Nigeria, wherever it might be, the normals are out there. It's the same struggle for dignity and for a future for our families. And the first question that I get when they see my yarmulke uh, in, in one of these places, maybe the first Jew they've seen, isn't about anti-Semitism or where Israel's final political borders will be. It's about like, oh, we've heard about Jews. You've been around a couple of thousand years. Can you share some of your values? Like, why mm -hmm. does a Jew in Toronto care about a Jew in Kiryat Shmona, Israel. Can you just explain it? Like, are you Jewish or you're Canadian? Are you an American? That I think is the most important aspect of all. If we can get help from the media to tell a story that's a bit deeper than bagels and locks, um, we can do a long way to uh, creating a new generation of allies in the overall fight. And of course, uh, AJC, the Wiesenthal Center, we don't need to be asked to speak out against attacks on Asian Americans because of COVID-19. First of all, we're also attacked. And secondly, as Jews, Brad mentioned it, back in the Torah, we're told over and over again, you have a special 
responsibility to be especially sensitive to the alien, to the downtrodden, etc. So a lot of the things that make me tick as a Jew are really universal values. We don't have any opportunity right now in the mainstream media to even get that point of view across. It's all about which synagogue got attacked and uh, was it white supremacist in all likelihood? And if it isn't, then the story disappears. Brad, you're shaking your head yes. Yeah, I, I can't agree more. I mean, I think, I think the, the more um, we see each other, the more we realize we have in common. I think the rabbi hit it right on the head. And, there's, and, and to answer your question, I just think, you know, is it the social media people? Is it, is it the regular television stations? Is it the way we talk to each other? The answer is yes and yes and yes and yes and yes. It's all these things. Right? And each of us on this panel, the reason you chose us is we all, we, we represent each of us a sliver, right? Even down to the blonde woman, you know? And, and Holly, I love what you said. You know, here's the blonde on the panel. It's like, I'm not even Jewish. I'm on the Jewish panel. Let's go for it, right? Each of us has a different view that's vital that only we can bring. And I agree with every, everything that everyone said, but we each have to, um, you know, and some of us are going to be able to influence the actual media and say, hey, you have to report better. I think the, whole, the thing we can influence um, is that people in the world today, we just wanna feel it. We don't care what the facts are, right? We, we trust what we feel, not what even the rules are or what the truth is. And for me, that just makes this, this problem more complicated than ever. And we used to have, as, as Rabbi said at the start, when we had the, you know, the Paleys and the Walter Conkites and that voice that said, I'm the gatekeeper, I'm gonna tell you what the truth is and go with it, then it's easy. Talk to those three networks. You got the, the solution. I remember coming to the Paley Center when I was younger and there weren't, there weren't all these channels, there weren't all these publications. There wasn't Twitter where we can all suddenly have our own publications. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the more we can see each other as human beings, it reminds me there's this great program in Israel where they take Palestinian kids and Israeli kids and they put them in a camp together. And the first night, no one sleeps because they each think that the other side's going to murder them in the middle of the night. Right. Think about that a moment. And then they wake up and they spend the summer together. And like any Jewish summer camp, they're like they become friends. And I know that that can sound so naive, like we're not going to send everyone to summer camp. But my God, if we can just see what we have in common and put that word out there, that is to me the path forward. And we're all going to do it in different ways. I, I think to, to what Brad just said, I, I think we all represent a sliver. I agree with that. But let's remember, we're all part of a large center that understands that tolerance, education uh, are, are a path forward. And I think that's where the media sometimes runs too quickly to the extremes because extremes sell. And that's the reality. So I think uh, the overarching uh, message, and again, applauding the Paley Center for bringing in uh, uh, the panel and, and so forth, is that we are, a, there's, a, there's a large, I don't want to use the term silent majority that has a uh, historical connotation, but there is a large swath of society that are good people, they're tolerant, and we have to make sure there's no discrimination and education and, and, and daylight to, to disinfect. And that's where I think the media can hopefully play a role, even though it may not be as, as sellable, that's where I think we, we need to point. Rebecca, can I just uh, you know, piggyback on that? Uh, you know, Right now in the middle of these, these horrible events going on in the Holy Land, you just, you know, some people just throw up their hands and say, there's never gonna be peace. Well, you know, the Abrahamic Accords did take place. Uh, never mind politically, who was the president at the time, we should eventually get past that. But as someone who was involved in some of the building blocks in the UAE and Bahrain and knocking down some of my own stereotypes, it's a story that the media has not yet told, which means that former enemies have chosen to normalize their relationship and to go deeper. They may make more money. Um, hospitals uh, in Bahrain may be better uh, equipped now because they have an opportunity to interact with some Israeli hospitals. They're normalizing relationships. Just before uh, going on with this wonderful panel, I had to do a two minute, as we say, drusha, you know, a sermon. You ready? For uh, main Eid in Saudi Arabia. They had to get like a, uh, the rabbi, the non-PC folks from the Wiesenthal Center. They wanted to have our voice there because we've invested in learning about the other. We didn't go to summer camp and Brad, maybe we should think about creating summer camps for adults. That's a narrative in so many different ways 
that only the media has the power to fully share. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sure a lot of people watching right now are also interested in what they can do as well to combat anti-Semitism. Brad, let's start with you. What can people do? Um, tell your story. Tell your story. There are We are losing our Holocaust survivors, but they're out there. There's a friend of mine, Saul Dreyer, 95 years old, started a Holocaust memorial band. Take your kids, show them on YouTube. He's literally playing all around the country right now. That's what you can do. That's what's in your power, right? Is put on YouTube and show the story. There is nothing like watching people to react when they see the real videos and they see the real people and they hear that story that happened. That's within our power. Amy? I'd say our power lies in treating each individual with dignity and understanding that each person is a human being. And I think if you lead a life and you illustrate and show how to treat others with respect and create a community of people who respect others and appreciate difference, then you'll find that that is the type of community that you can feel comfortable in as well. Mark? I'm gonna take the corollary of what Brad had said before. He says, tell the story, which I agree with. I also would say, listen, uh, hear the stories. Don't be closed-minded to your own group, your own story, which is fine, but hear others, listen to what they're about, listen to them as people, as individuals. And again, if we eliminate discrimination, that's how we do it, is understanding each other better and being more tolerant of each other. Rabbi Cooper? Well, Simon Wiesenthal said it best, I think. Freedom is not a gift from heaven. It must be earned every day. And aren't we lucky that we are Americans and have our rights? And that means that silence is not an option. Uh, you have to act. And you have to be also aware of one thing. We're all about rights, but understand we have freedom of speech and that the Jews learned the hard way. And I'm afraid we're all being attacked right now with the fact that people forget that words have consequence. Be careful of what you say and how you say it. And in just listening to Brad Meltzer uh, talk about, maybe we should also be listening more to our inner child. Uh, if we go back there, we might find what uh, our parents taught us. Uh, and we shouldn't be breaking those links. The emphasis on stories in our tradition is we have a link that goes back thousands of years. In America today, we have to reestablish those links and we, we have the power to expand them uh, to other communities. So it's, um, you know, we're lucky to live here, uh, but remember Simon Wiesenthal's warning. And finally, Holly. I'm wondering if there's anything left. No, I am. Um, I'll just I'll add, you know, the listening, the, the the speaking out and up, and you know, being an active, engaged citizen, writing to Congress, working with law enforcement, you know, tracking hate crime data, et cetera. But I think the biggest thing is going to be the showing up piece. When I look back, you know, and I've been in this field for about ten years with combating anti-Semitism, but even longer, like the biggest successes we've had in pushing back against anti-Semitism, actually seeing the needle change has when, again, when the non-Jews are coming alongside Jews and saying an attack against you is an attack against all of us, whether in Billings, Montana or Whitewell, um, Whitwell, Tennessee with the paperclip stories, um, or even recently with the um, desecrations of synagogues in St. Louis and Philadelphia, when Muslims and Christian communities raised funds and helped rebuild, like that's what pushes the anti-Semite to the, to the distance. And that's what we need to do with him. Holly, thank you so much. Amy, Holly, Mark, Rabbi Cooper, Brad, thank you to all of you for joining us for this excellent conversation. Um, and thanks so much to everyone who joined us for this special Paley Impact event. Be sure to support the Paley Center and consider becoming a Paley member by visiting paleycenter.org.